Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Paddle Pursuit. This is episode number 22. I'm your host, Robert Norman, and we're here today with Gary Richardson, who may or may not be the coolest guy in Florida Paddle. So I messaged Gary recently, and I was like, hey, you want to be on the podcast? And his exact words, let me pull out my phone and find it. It's something to the effect of, yeah, but I'm a nobody. And that's not what the podcast is about. You don't have to be like a professional or world champion or anything like that. As long as you enjoy paddling, you've been part of the community, and you're an overall cool person, man, we're interested in having you on the podcast and spotlighting you. Gary, thank you so much for taking the time and being on the show. Oh, thank you for inviting me. So give me a rundown. So I know loosely some of your start. I know that you started with, I think, Dragon Boat and got into paddling. So kind of walk us through some of your history and the integration into the world of paddle. All right. So I've actually been in the paddle community for, I think, probably around probably 11, maybe 12 years now. And I actually started out with Dragon Boating, and I never knew anything about Dragon Boating. Until a friend of mine from Mount Dora, uh, her name's Carol, and she sent me pictures of uh, her crew, uh, Wound Fun crew, and the the head camera from from the coach watching the secrecy of the whole entire twenty paddlers in sync. It, it, I was hooked. I mean, I was hooked right off the bat. So I had to find a club near me and at the time i was living in titusville and started searching i found a club in melbourne uh, called heart and soul and they're a breast cancer survivor uh club which was um i don't know it's like one of those things like things happen for a reason um uh, my best friend uh, laura was uh going through breast cancer and i was like wow how cool is this you know join a, you know, I could be a supporter and I got people to help. And, but I started dragon boat and I had my friends who actually gave me some little land lessons on how to hold the paddle, you know, how to rotate, you know? So when I first got in the boat, I kind of knew what I was supposed to do. And we started going and man, I tell you, I, I fell in love with it the very first day. Um, from there, uh, I had a coach uh, from Vermont who actually, it was about a, probably a year, maybe a year and a half later into dragon boating. He invited me to be part of his national team. And so I paddled with uh, Dragonheart of Vermont, Vermont and we, we won nationals uh, and we ended up going to Hungary for World Club Crew Championships, which was, I mean, that was like, wow. I, you know, never knew anything about dragon boating. And a year and a half later, I'm in Hungary. First time ever being out of the country, <laughs> you know, racing against all kinds of uh, people. I mean, it, it was it was an experience. So, I don't know, I was, I was probably in dragon boating for about maybe five years. And, you know, the, just kind of had some things going on. And I, I ended up searching and, and you know, I knew some people were doing outrigger canoeing, and it was right here in Cocoa, you know, right out of the port. Never knew about it. I've lived here all my life, and, you know, water, I mean, I've surfed all my life, and so I started coming out. And first, I think the first time I, uh, I wasn't used to double bend paddles. <laughs> of course, uh, I get in the boat, and I got my paddle backwards, and, you know, coach my my coach uh, he, he's like gary turn the paddle around like <laughs> and from there uh i don't know i was probably paddling with the club for maybe i don't know five six months and i, I mean again i found something else that i love just as much if not more and i went and uh, bought a brand new kahali Outrigger canoe, my uh, first one person canoe. And yeah, I hoolied a lot. <laughs> 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 but, you know, I had someone tell me, because um, I, I would always, I've asked anybody about, you know, 
how should I hold my paddle? How should I do this? And, you know, I had one person tell me, well, you hold, you reach too high up and that's why you hooli all the time. And I'm like, oh, okay. And, uh, but you know what? I mean, I'm immediately, I try to fly the you know, yellow. You know, yeah, I hooli a lot. Then I met this guy. I mean, I, I posted something on Facebook that I did. I forget how many miles I did and and how fast I went. And it, at the time, I didn't. I guess I didn't re know how to read my uh, speed codes. <laughs> and this guy, uh, his name's Robert Norman. <laughs> <laughs> he joined in on me, and he goes, "Wow, that's awesome!" He goes, "You should come to my race in uh, Lake Hernando." And I'm like, oh, I don't know if I'm ready for that. And then we figured it out. And I, yeah, I read my speed coach wrong and I wasn't really that fast. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I went to, uh, I went to your race. That was my first ever race. And I'll tell you what, that was an experience. Um, the, the, I, I don't know. It's like the Ohana that was, that was there at Lake Fernando. Um, I know. I remember when I, I walked up to you because you've you've always been so good to me and you always showed me. Uh, you were private messaging me sometimes, just give me tips and you know, which was I, you know, I don't know. I wasn't used to that, and I do the same thing now. I mean, what maybe five years later, you know, I'm still doing it. Um, but that first race. Uh, I'm <laughs> we took off and I thought I was like going to be real good, you know. I'm keeping up with everybody, and I think maybe the first hundred yards. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it it was a it was an eye opener. Uh, I was like post arms were burning. I had no rhythm, you know. I had no technique. And I didn't realize that because I, I never had anybody in my hometown show me anything different. And uh, from there, I I actually watched a lot of YouTube videos. And and then I always reached out to you. And I remember one time I reached out to you. You were out of town or you, you were at a race. You messaged me back. Like, you were in your, you know, I know you weren't paddling it it was at the event and you started giving me some pointers you know i tell you what i mean robert if it wasn't for you giving me guidance and showing me techniques and and then watching your videos you know i'd probably still be struggling and you know i mean i'm, I'm not the, any i'm no contender but i enjoy racing um from there i mean i started I learned how to steer an OC6, you know, with uh, Lokaihi Cocoa Beach. And that was an, ex I think the first day I went out, the wind was like 20, 20 mile an hour winds, headwinds. Um, man, I, now I talk about Mr. Zigzag, man. I was all over the place. <laughs> uh, but I, I love steering, you know. So, in order for me to get better at steering, I I, I bought a uh, a V1. Of course, it was the, the three the five R three X that weighs like close to forty pounds. Mm -hmm. Um, I I mean, of course, it you know I fell in love with that boat because it's got all these like Jamaican colors all over it. It's bright, it's like hey, look at me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I started learning that and. That really helped my uh, steering in an OC6 big time. Mm -hmm. um, I can, you know, but even with the uh, V1, uh, my first race was in Miami. And I, I think I met um, Ty there. Uh, they, <laughs> they saw me um, with my canoe. And they're like, hey, that's a nice canoe. And I was like, thanks. This is like my... I'm paddling it and I'm racing. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you what, I was ready. I was, I was ready to make the big eight mile loop. And, uh, and they changed the courts on us. 
because the uh, chase boat, uh, I guess they weren't there on Sunday. So they made this triangle race and it was straight out into these like chop. You had to make a turn. Let me tell you what, that was probably the worst paddling experience I ever had. <laughs> but I mean, I didn't give up. Well, I did give up. I only made one lap. <laughs> <laughs> But I was doing really good. Um, I mean, I was keeping up with everybody. And um, Ty told me to just make rock wide turns. And I did. I was coming around and I was like, wow, that's cool. I'm making it, I'm going to time the uh, swells right. Came around the se- near the second buoy and three um, outriggers buoyed. Mm-hmm. And I already had my line. I'm like, oh, crap. So I made a turn, you know, to go around them. Wave hit me from the side. I hoolied, and guess who didn't have a bailer in their boat? Oh my gosh! <laughs> oh no! <laughs> I had a half a boat of water. I I I paddled it all. You know, finally, thirty minutes later, I ended up getting it back to shore. Um, but you know what? I tried, and that just made me more determined to get better at it. Um, well, that's, that's one of the common themes of um, trying new paddle disciplines is persevering, right? Like flying the ama and huliing. And as we talk about in the surf ski world, it's the same in all paddling disciplines is the swim tax, right? You all got, everybody's got to pay the swim tax. The V1 is real tricky because it's an open cockpit. They're better about having bulkheads now, but some of the old school boats are like open. So, I mean, they like fill with water and <laughs> actually sink. So I wanted to circle back to some of the other points that uh, you had mentioned. And first of all, thank you for, you know, saying all the nice stuff. I didn't uh, pay Gary to uh, say all that. No, I kind of forgot didn't. some of that stuff. And Yeah, uh, I haven't. <laughs> and, uh, you know, somebody took the time to give me the same courtesy. So it's always a baton pass forward, right? Somebody reached out, messaged me, hey, like, you could paddle better if you did X, Y, and Z. And it's just like, awesome. Like, and uh messaging people during races. Literally, uh, I was coaching at Clearwater today. The moment I got off the water, I was answering emails about like technique, right? So it's, you know, I'm always thinking about it and always ready to help people that are, you know, willing to reach out. So the, interacting with you is, of course, free uh, online school stuff. But that was kind of like the, the framework of like, I enjoy it, right? Like, I don't think too much about it. Like, I like paddling. If people like paddling, if I can make them go faster, you know, life is good. So you mentioned Dragon Hearts in Vermont. Who is the coach for that? John Dyer. Gotcha. Time. Okay. Because I was John, trying to think. John of, Linda Dyer. Because there's a couple of um, different Vermont people that I know, and I wasn't sure if they coach that specific team. And I think there's another couple of teams that are up there that I'm familiar with. So that's super are. cool. Um, one of the big draws into Dragon Boat is exactly how you outlined your experience, where you start. And like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And then dot, dot, dot. Then I'm at the world championship doing this amazing thing, right? And the amount of infrastructure that Dragon Boat has is amazing, right? It is. So going from that and then going into Outrigger Canoe, you can see that like going to Outrigger Canoe World Championship is like an unclear path. Like it's very hard <laughs> to like figure out what you have to do to like make that a reality. But in Dragon Boat, it's very like go to Club Crew Nationals, qualify go to the country that's hosting it race the other teams and it's a very concise you know um pattern into getting there so it's really cool experience that you're able to go and do that talking about um paddling in an area where you've been your whole life i get that all the time with uh, k2n where people are like you guys paddle out here it's like yeah we're out here seven days a week and it's like i've lived here my whole life and i, I didn't know that you guys did that and it, it kind of shows that like paddling is like its own underground niche. Even if you do it all the time, the amount of eyeballs that are on you is very minimal. So it's almost like the secret club of like speakeasies where like you got to know somebody to get into it. And that's kind of a hard bridge to gap in making the sport more accessible for people. Because if more people could just see it, they would instantly be more interested in it. But like you said, you can live in a town your whole life. And two blocks away, they do this really cool thing every single day, and you just don't even know anything about it. Yeah. So that's that's Lukahi, right? So uh, tell us tell us more about your first time 
uh, steering and drawing. What we say is you write your name in cursive the first time that you go steering, right? So you're yeah. zigzagging all over the place. So what oh, was yes. it like? You got in the boat. What were the conditions like and how did that go? Oh, man. Uh, so at first I had to back the boat out into because uh, where we put in is at a boat dock. So we had to push off the dock and then back the boat out of this little cove area. And that's like it's surrounded by seawall. Mm -hmm. And we come right out into the port area where all the cruise ships are. So on this day, I got the boat. I had help getting the boat turned around from being backwards. And the winds had, I mean, I, they were around 20 mile an hour winds. And if anybody knows about, you know, 40 foot boat, you know, going into a wind, it wants to just point straight in. So if the wind's coming from the side and you want to go straight ahead, that boat wants to turn. And I did not know poking. I didn't know. I mean, my brain was scrambled. You know, I poked and the boat would go someplace else. I'm like, ah, you know, I was like, yeah, I, I felt really bad with my crew that I had. They, really patient with me um but i mean I, th I think on the first day with those winds and choppy conditions that probably was not the best idea <laughs> for brand new steersman to get in a boat <laughs> try to steer a boat um I kept saying sorry to my crew <laughs> and they kept telling me don't say sorry you're doing fine it was a lot of encouragement um, and that's one thing about the uh, Outrigger uh, community. There's a lot of encouragement. Um, in fact, uh, I'm just going to throw one, one club out that I really appreciate a lot is uh, Task Force Hydro One. Mm -hmm. That is an example club to, that, I mean, the oh Ohana, you know, it's family. They treat everybody like family. They educate, they, 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 it's like the whole Hawaiian tradition. They get together for potlucks, you know, they help each other, you know, they teach each other um, stroking and, you know, and we taught them and they came to us in Lokaihi to learn how to paddle. And they drove from Jacksonville, you know, every, every Sunday until they learned and they, they started their own club dock. So it was really cool. But, um, yeah, the steering, that was, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm a very competitive guy. And if there's something I can't do, I'm going to do my best to prove myself wrong. And now, I mean, after that first day, I figured now nah, they're never going to ask me to come back. And Well, next practice, they put me back there again. And uh, my coach, Scott, <laughs> he, he literally sat behind me. But he sat on top of the back of the boat while I was in the steersman's seat, which later I found out. I was like, that made it harder for me to paddle, not to steer, because the boat was <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, okay, I got a little. I did get straighter, and eventually, um, you know, I would, I would paddle, and then I would come back and steer again. Eventually, I started, you know, I wanted to be like everybody else to go straight. So I just, I mean, I started reading on it. I started watching videos. I, I mean, that was my, probably a lot of my teaching, uh, besides getting tips from you, is I, I watched a lot of videos on YouTube. You know, just like, how do I do this? Or how do I steer an Outrigger 6? And then once I got the concept, um, then I started, you know, I got a V1. But now I'm learning how to paddle steer. That's all I do now. Um, every every once in a while I'll poke, you know, and but I I don't want to wear my crew down. I want my crew to I mean, if they get that boat going. I don't want to fall down, you know. So it's a you know your team, and there's no I in team. I can tell you that because it takes a whole crew to either win a race um, or just do the best you can. Um, uh, and yeah, I am very fortunate because there's a lot of people in my, in my club, uh, that have told me when we go out into, when we go out into the ocean. So there's days, uh, it's rough, big, and 
I've had uh, someone in, in our club who she doesn't want to be in the water. She doesn't want to hooli. And when we go out into rough seas, she actually came and told me one day, she was Gary, when we are out in the rough seas, I'm very, I feel very safe with you. So that was a huge compliment because I'm, you know, you're, you are the guy that's safety for everybody in the boat. And one wrong poke on the wrong side, over you go. And uh, luckily I've never had to do, I, I, we've hooled once, but that was only because uh, we, <laughs> we're pulling it back into the dock. And I asked uh, two seats to draw to the right. And everybody leaned out to the right. And we... <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> but um, even, I mean, just with my steering and, and now I, I love the V1. I'll probably never get rid of this heavy boat because it just tracks so well. Um, I do want the newer one one day. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, you know, I went to Hungary with, um, dragon, with dragon boating and... With uh, the Outrigger crews, I mean, I've been all over Florida racing. Uh, my One of my, probably my between my first, second, third race, I did the 12-mile Key West loop. Mm -hmm. um, that was that was a challenge. But, you know, I'm just one of those guys that's just, hey, I'm going to do this. Yeah, I mean, I'll come in last or maybe close to last or it's like, you know, it's just something for me to build on. And that's the way I, I look at outrigger canoeing. Um, I want to be just as fast or, you know, keep up with the pack. And when I see, you know, people leaving, you know, I, I try to paddle harder. But now I just got to tell myself it's a mental game. Race your own race. You know, don't chase anybody down. You know, burn yourself out. <laughs> um but I, I mean, I've been to the Gorge in uh, Oregon uh, a couple times now, which I love it. You know, that's a 12-mile downwinder. And I've been to Chattajack twice. Well, no, this year would be my third race. Uh, first year was an out Outrigger 6. Um, last year, I took my V1. Uh, I was very proud. You know, five hours, 28 minutes. Uh, taking the V1 down 32 miles. Um, I plan on doing that again this year. You know, um, I gotta get my belt buckle. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm a little <laughs> ahead of you on the uh, belt buckle. This will be my sixth time, but my fifth consecutive. So I'll be I'll get the uh, the belt buckle uh, this year. That's so, awesome. um, Caitlin Grady, who's been on the show, who's uh, part of the Sunset Beach Outrigger Canoe Club, and she's their steersman down there most of the time, and uh, she put it best on. When people are learning, you have to let them mess up. And it's just, it's a simple little quote, but I use it all the time now, right? Like when people, like we put them in seat three and they mess up huts or they are in seat one and they paddle too fast or they're in six and they're steering all over, let them mess up, right? Because if you don't let them mess up, they won't do it again. If you just, if you hammer them and kill them, right? So that encouragement is inherent. I think in paddling, especially, people are very encouraging because they're aware of how difficult all of this stuff is like every aspect of the sport is overwhelmingly difficult. Like we get into it and we get kind of like numb to like, Oh, you're just paddling and it's flying the ama. It's no big deal. If you just grab some dude from Walmart and throw him in a boat, like it's so, it's so eye opening on how hard all of it is. Right. And like you said, having that tenacity to wanting to do well, wanting to improve, wanting to get better. Those are fundamental things that, you know, create success in the sport if, if you're looking for the easy way there like paddling is not the answer like there's yeah. no easy route for anything and you know having that internal drive for oc6 steersmen two things that you went over right is the safety of your crew right that's an important that's one of the reasons people don't steer is because they understand how important of a role that is for safety not letting the boat hooli not crashing into the rocks stuff like that and they don't want to do it. They don't want to be responsible for five lives plus their own. And I, I never blame anybody if they get wicked out about steering because it, it is that important of a role. And helping your crew, right? 
So if you made it this far in the podcast, here's some technical info, right? Um, when Tahitians are steering, right, they expect over 90% forward strokes or draw strokes and paddle steering in flat water and 80% in super turbulent water. And if you want to the world championships in Samoa, it was like five foot, like breaking waves out there. And if you watch those guys, 80% of the time, they're taking some sort of a forward stroke and 20% of the time they're poking, right? So for every 10 forward strokes, they got two pokes and it's like the craziest ocean you've ever seen. Oh, yeah. So those are like, those are some easy statistics to follow. Um, in our boat, I have my wife in seat one and I'll be in seat six. And at the end, we like look at our garments and we see how many strokes we both took. And I try to figure out the percentage from that. Like, oh, today was like a 90% day or, you know, and so on. Right. So those are some fun games. If you're a steersman and you want to try to improve, right. Think about 80% in the ocean, 90% in flat water. Your crew loves you. Anything less than that. And man, you are, you are working them harder than they want to be worked. <laughs> that's, that's I never thought about looking at that because uh, we had practice today mm -hmm. and we went out to the ocean and it was probably about maybe eight seconds between wells. Mm -hmm. It was just it was rough. It was choppy, you know. So it makes it a lot harder to, to navigate through that. And uh, I mean, I did a lot of paddling, but I did a lot of I mean, a little poking too. Uh, Stayed away from the right side for sure because uh, that's just a recipe for Huli. <laughs> but I want to touch base on when you were saying about letting people make mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, when I was first learning how to steer, I had another steersman that was teaching me from uh, seat five. Mm -hmm. And every time the boat started going a different way, she would um, correct it. Mm-hmm. And it was like, <clears throat> you know, it's, I mean, I was to the point, it's like, it, am I, am I doing it right? Or I don't know. And she kept doing it. And finally, I said, stop correcting me. <laughs> 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 I said, I'm not going to learn if you don't let me make a mistake and let me get it in my head. Because at first, it's almost like a foreign language mm -hmm. because your brain is telling you, you know, you got to poke on the on the you know left to go the other way, and I'm like, but then all of a sudden you know this, but your brain is like, no, I need to go to the right side, mm -hmm. and then it goes the other way, and it's like, <laughs> so once I figured out, and she let finally let me start making my own mistakes, you know, once I'm getting the the concept of you know keeping the boat fairly straight. Um, once I started making my own mistakes, it started sinking in more. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, you know, like like, like I said, uh, today um, we had a great practice out in the ocean. You know, coming back was fun because, we, you know, we got to, I mean, we didn't catch any waves, you know, not like, you know, in Hawaii, but we caught these swells back into the pool. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we had some nice little bumps. I mean, it wasn't anything spectacular i mean but the crew didn't have to work as hard <laughs> and that's the main thing is uh keeping my boat straight and and taking the pressure off the crew and letting them paddle and get that momentum going and the more i paddle the the more it helps them and i'm not you know, i don't want to be that guy <laughs> <laughs> So you mentioned a bunch of races that you've done, um, Chattajack Gorge. Kind of walk us through um, some of your favorite events and what makes them stand out to you. Um, I would say the uh, the Paddle Battle Treasure Coast mm -hmm. is probably one of my favorite races. It's a you know it's a small race. It's not anything like huge miles or anything, but it's the conditions that we go, you know where the loop goes. You know how you certain you know launch from the beach, and you know, the beach start to me is kind of like uh, I don't know I I kind of get amped up on the beach start like I did on, at the start of a dragon boat race. Mm -hmm. You know you're like anticipating, waiting, 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 and then time in the swell is coming in, and like boom, get in, go, <laughs> and then crashing through the waves on the way out. It's, you know, to me that's probably one of my favorite parts like going through that. Um. But also, I like clear water boats. Uh, in fact, I think last year was one of my 
uh, the, one of the funner races, but I mean, we were getting beat, beat up by the, by the ocean. Um, mm -hmm. it was, it was, I think it was the first race that went out. It was yep. the, the men's race and, <laughs> you know, we're in a, a spec boat <clears throat> and we're like, Oh, I mean, as you're coming through that inlet, it's like, Oh crap. Look at, you know, these swells were coming in from sideways and, you know, and I was in seat two on this day. I didn't want to steering. Um, and man, it's like being up in seat two coming over these waves. And it's like, you're up airborne coming back down. Um, but that race, I mean, I, you know, they say, keep your head um, up, keep your head straight. Don't, you know, I, I call it, don't be a squirrel, you know, Oh, look at the dolphin. <laughs> <laughs> you know? um, that was a race where you just kept focused and we just kept going and pushing and pushing. And then when we came back into the, uh, you know, to finish line, we were, you know, beaching the boat and we looked back and it was like, we're second place. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that was like probably one of my favorite races because the conditions were just, they were rough. It wasn't just flat water. Mm -hmm. You know, we were hitting waves. And then on the way back, we were just same thing, you know, getting hitting waves on the Ama side, you know, trying to keep the Ama's popping up and we're popping it back down. You know, that's when you know, hey, I, I think I've really learned something. And, you know, we we kept the boat straight and I mean it got a little squirrely and when we felt that I'm flying up we you know we knew that we had to get back on the other side mm -hmm. and so we beat the challenges and but um I would say you know I, my, those are my two favorite local races here and the gorge is just I'm a Florida boy I mean <laughs> I don't get to see much so. <laughs> <laughs> and to and to, write, and to paddle down that board and you know connect wave after wave you know um to me that, that that's one of my favorites because you're moving fast you i mean you're still paddling hard but you get a break every once in a while you know you get to ride those waves and and you know now i have an aries you know i i Traded in my my Kahele, and now I have the Aries. I only went with the Aries because, um, you know, I want to. You know, I live near the beach, so I take it out and I'll surf some of the little beach. And we don't have like downwinders on this. I miss. I, I wish we did, <laughs> but um, getting better at you know the surfing the waves here, and you know, I'm still trying to go to the gorge. This uh, you know when it's coming up here, what July. Mm -hmm. yeah july so <clears throat> i'm still I, i've already signed up for it but uh just uh you know was laid off like six weeks ago starting a new job so i don't know if they're gonna let me go <laughs> gotcha yeah but, yeah i like that and i'm hooked on the chat attack even though it's like 32 miles you know it's it's just one of those things when you finish it it's like pat yourself on the back i did it i mean you know i'm just like i I don't have to come in first or I don't have to come in the top five or top 10 knowing that I finished it. And this year doing it again, my goal is to beat my time from last year. <laughs> you know? Yeah. That's one of the big draws of all events that are special to people is like you said, uh, overcoming like a trial of some sort, right? Whether it's super rough conditions, it's a super long distance going out of your comfort zone and surfing waves for real at the gorge. All those things are like contributing factors that make people want to do it again, or it gets them hooked on their training and trying to do those things. You mentioned Key West being rough. The first time I did Key West, I got done. I was like, I'm happy to be alive, man. Like, well, yeah, and, that's why I was. <laughs> yep. And then it's like, and then after you do it a few more times, it's like, it's even worse, but you're just like battle hard and ready for it. Right. But the first ones are always so memorable where it's like, how the hell did I come out alive at the other end of that? And I think that's some of the magic that, you know, kind of, you know, ignites people. Uh, I agree. Clearwater is one of my favorite uh, races. It's like, and it's kind of like Treasure Coast, where it's not a huge thing for Florida. It's big, but it's just like 
you know, every year, you know, the whole club, we all train for it and everybody gets psyched yeah. for it. And it's always a big deal. And uh, the conditions are always varied. And uh, I agree. I, I really like the uh, clear water. Speaking of Chatted Jack, uh, we need to convince uh, the administration there to make V1 a category. That would be ah, the next that step. That would be awesome. Because right now it's an outrigger canoe, and I don't think it's an outrigger canoe for any other reason than simplicity, right? So I think a couple emails and like, you know, and they'd be like, hey, if you can get 10 people to do V1, we'll make it a category. Right. And uh, I think that would be, there's a booming popularity in V1 in general. You're ahead of the curve on that one, right? Because you've had yours for yeah. a little while now. And uh, there are all these races here. We're trying to make V1 a category. You know, Ozone shipping in new boats. There's a couple other brands that are floating around. And I think V1 in the next year or two will blossom into a legitimate category where people are, you know, um, more likely to do it. It's hard racing the V1 against outrigger canoes. Uh, on paper, if you're born in Polynesia and born in a V1, <laughs> it goes faster. But for yes. the rest of us, it's like this boat is pretty hard to, you know, the yes, rudder simplifies is. things, right? So the V1 is like there's this huge learning curve on using it effectively. Um, looking at events, is there anything on like, do you have like a bucket list of things that you want to do, whether it's around the world or around the country? Are there any events that you have your eyeball on that you want to do before, you know, your paddling career is over? Shoot. My, I, I'm, my paddle, I'm never, it's never going to be over. <laughs> I'll do it to the day I die. <laughs> yeah. I didn't want to say until like before you die, I didn't want to be morbid, <laughs> but that's kind of what I meant. <laughs> um, there, you know, I do want to go to Hawaii um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, I want to be able to go there and try to do some of the downwinds um, that they have there. And I want to, I really want to do an outrigger six, you know, six person crew race. That would be awesome. Uh, I don't know if that, you know, I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to do that. Uh, it'd be great. Uh, I was invited last year. Um, uh, with Will, I think you know Will from Jacksonville. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. They did Queen Lily, right? Yeah, they did the yeah, Queen yeah, Lily. Right. Mm -hmm. He asked me to go, and it was just bad timing for me. I was like, oh man, if I, you know, at the time, if you know, conditions were better for me, I would have jumped on that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I mean, yeah, that's one of my bucket lists to go there. Um, you know, first it was the uh, like the. The or Oregon, you know, the downwind. Oh, I've done that. And and then my club was doing the um, 32 mile chat. I, I heard, what is chat attack? And then, oh, it's 32 miles, you know. Da, da, da. And so finally, I was invited to go. And luckily, you know, I had an open seat. All right, let's do this. And I was worried. Uh, I've never paddled 32 miles in my life, but, you know, I trained. I, did my best and tell you what uh your your brain is probably the worst enemy because it's it tells you you can't go any further you can't do it you can't do it and then you just push through and then once you hit that plateau i mean i call it like a like you're a machine now you're you're, just, you're going through and you're you know you're digging hard and next thing you know it's over it's like, mm -hmm. You know, that's the way it was in the V1 last year. Um, I, my, of course, my watch stopped at 27 miles, so I don't know. What my... <laughs> <laughs> but um, I kept hearing one guy, him and his wife was in a, in a two-person, and I kept hearing him say, it's just around the next corner. <laughs> you know, and I'm going, oh, finally. Thank you, you know, go around the next corner. There's no finish line. <laughs> I think we went about like maybe five corners, and finally I saw where we're supposed to be. <laughs> but it's just one of those. You know, I don't know. It's so yeah. Hawaii is probably the you know one of the Queen Lily or uh, any of them. I'm, I, I was actually asked to join a club and go, and regardless what race, I I I do it only because I know I know I can do it now. Um, you know, when I train, when I train for the Chat Attack, I at Merritt Island here, um, uh, it's an 18 mile loop. So they can start, you know, on the Banana Riverside, come around, you know, 
go through Sykes Creek and head back out to the end of Merritt Island and come back around, it's 18 miles. Um, I I was training in that for Catajac, you know, going, you know, I would make a 32 mile uh, trip, you know, go one way down the river, then come back. Of course, every time he did it, like the wind and the chop, boat weight, you know, it just made it harder. And I was like, this sucks. But once I got on the, you know, I, I knew once I got on that river, <laughs> we're going one way. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Um, no, I mean, I really don't keep track of what races are coming up. Um, I hear through, you know, I don't, I probably should follow it more. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean, if I, if I have the time and, you know, the, the cash or whatever to take off to go across state for a couple of days and, you know, I'm there, you know, as long as I get registered in time. Yeah, the um, Hawaii is is like the holy grail for a lot of people. Like you said, like the barrier is a uh, you know plane and you know hotel expenses and all that. Queen Lily is really cool, and uh, it's one that most people recommend. I'm not saying that it's a mellow paddle, right? But oh, it's yeah. one you know. There's like hundreds of boats, right? And they go around the island, so it's not like the Molokai to Oahu, where it's like 32 miles one way, and like it could be like 10 foot seas and stuff. But it, yeah, you still get pounded by the pacific ocean but it's so cool like if you google the queen lily i can't say the full queen lily name it's like five more you know um <laughs> uh consonances and stuff right? right um but if you look that up it's so cool seeing it because the boats are like lined up for like a mile out yeah. right they're just all lined up and then they i don't even know how they coordinate the start right you got like the blow horn there's no way that it's loud enough for everybody right i guess they just see each other start paddling and hit it all kinds of different age categories, divisions, all this stuff, right? And you don't know who you're racing, right? You're just lined right. up against, you know, whoever, and you get done, you're like, were we first or were we like 75th? <laughs> like, we have no idea. <laughs> and uh, so I, I've heard some really good things about that. Um, for downwind runs, uh, Maliko runs, those are the ones that people swear by, right? Because it's very consistent and they're like three to five foot consistently and it's not like, crazy 11 foot you know super swells or something out uh on some of the other runs and uh, i have all that on my bucket list too and like you said like you know you start adding up like support boat support boat costs and you yes. know travel expenses and hotels and all this is like holy crap it's like, not a cheap sport <laughs> it's not a, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah a lot of the tra especially the traveling for events that's where it starts to like escalate a lot right and uh, even purchasing boats, like, you know, there's a big barrier to entry uh, for a lot of people. Um, that's one of the basis of my organization is they they don't have to worry about it, right? Like they, they show up and, you know, they pay, you know, a dollar a day. And they, yeah. it, here's my freaking Draco Pro, go paddle it out on the, the water. And, <laughs> but giving people the opportunity to figure out if they like it by giving them the equipment, you can use as much as you want. When people fall in love with it, right, then they allocate, you know, money towards it or buy used or whatever and uh, find a way to get into it more, right? But there's a lot of people where it's like, hey, before you can paddle this, you got to buy it. They would never do it, right? No. So just giving them that entry into the well, sport. I, I did that <laughs> <laughs> because everybody had one and I want to go play in the water with everybody, you know? So, yeah, I, you know, stepped it up and bought a brand new Kahaley. <laughs> so looking at um, the sport, your interactions with it, right? What are some of the pieces of advice that you could give to somebody who is new to the sport, getting into it, trying to figure out how seriously they want to take it. What's some advice that you can impart on them? I would, I would definitely say, uh, you know, meet up with someone who can definitely let you use their boat, you know, Just give them, you know, have them give you pointers, you know, effort, and, you know, how to paddle correctly before you get bad habits. I know with me, when I first got in mine, I didn't have anybody yet. I mean, we would paddle, but there was just no, there, I had, I didn't have that, um, hey, you're doing this wrong, or hey, try this, you know, um, I relied on YouTube, YouTube and Robert Norman, I mean, honestly, <laughs> and I'm not doing that just to plug your spot, I mean, this is your show, you've helped me a lot, 
Um, and with the, you know, your generosity, um, just to help people. I mean, I've always, you know, I see you at every race. Uh, you're either, you know, first or you're right there, at, you know, at first. I mean, I'm, I'm normally, you know what? I'm like second place. I'm like the perennial silver medalist, man. Like I'm okay. the greatest silver medalist that I get my butt kicked by somebody at a lot of these races. <laughs> but I think, I think you set the uh, mark, that, that goal for people. You're the guy that people want to be, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, and that's what, you know, that's what strives me. I mean, I'll never beat you, <laughs> but you never know, like, man. You never know. I would know. like to be, um, you know, I like to get, be faster. Um, I found out with the Aries, um, it's a different boat. You know, it's more volume uh, than the Kahali. And, you know, for, again, back to the, you know, suggestions. Test out a couple boats first. You know, see which one feels better. Don't just jump into a boat that someone says, oh, you need a boat. You know, you should get this boat. Because I tried that at the beginning. Of course, I was trying to find a used one. Every time I saw one, boom, it was gone. Sure. <laughs> So uh, I was, um, I contacted someone and he suggested to go with the uh, Kahali. He asked me how much I weighed, you know, this and that, what's your height. He, he suggested that. And I've always, I mean, I don't know. I've always felt the Kahali was not my boat. Um, I did my best in it. I learned how to fly the Yama in it. Um, I surfed it, you know, it was, it's a different, it's definitely a different animal than the, uh, Aries. Um, and I, <clears throat> I was going to try the Draco, but I don't know. I'm one of these that I start getting on the internet. And, you know, what's the difference between this and this? And so I kind of went with the boat that was an all around boat, you know, for surfing and flat water. So, and, you know, I don't know if I'm totally happy with it. Maybe it's just me. Um, I like my V1. <laughs> I I think that's the boat that I I need you know that's for me. Um, I can make it go. Uh, any little bump. I mean, I can I can pop in on someone's wake and just you know, and it's that whole paddle steering. Um, I've learned so much in that boat. It, you know, it's, you just gotta find the boat, and if you have people that you know who have boats. Most people will let you paddle and try it out. Um, man, my boat was like brand new, or pretty, almost brand new. I bought it used, but it's only been used like six times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to me, it was still brand new. And you know, I went, I went uh, to Jacksonville for a little fun gathering race. And I had some new people. Here, take my boat. You know, just don't get it near the barnacles on the poles. <laughs> you know, it didn't have any scratches. <laughs> but no, nah, I, I think people should try different boats first and see what works for them. Uh, you know, ask somebody, um, you know, who knows about all the boats, you know, get suggestions, you know, see what kind of, uh, I don't mean, so much into it. You know, find a paddle that works for you. Not all paddles, you're, you're not going to like all paddles. Um, I had my hippo stick, and, well, I lost that one. <laughs> I think when I went when I went to Hernando on my birthday. Oh, shoot, uh, that's right. That's yeah. right. The, the, sea, the sea took it. You know, I lost I lost my hippo stick at Hernando as well. I, I let somebody borrow it, and they left it on the beach. So that there are two hippo sticks floating out there somewhere in the east. Yeah. I've been checking the uh, pawn shops and there's no two hippo sticks floating around. Yeah, I lost my uh dragon boat paddle and my hippo stick that that weekend. But you know <laughs> so, but no, I'm definitely check out people, you know, different boats, you know, see which one you feel better in. Um, you know, some you, you can sit down further. Uh some of them you're sitting on top of them. I don't really, I mean, I don't know if I care for the ones that you sit on up higher. I think a lot of what, the hookies. The yeah, hookies the hookies like and the hurricane. It's, like, it's kind of like an old school design yeah. of sitting like on the top of the boat. 
Um, and then once you get one, set it light. You know, don't, you know, and that's what I did at first. Um, I, I wanted to, you know, I was asking around and someone said, set it light and get used to it. Because if you set it heavy, you're gonna you're gonna just be, you know, dragging. You're gonna be used to that heavy, and then one day when you want to go light, you, you're gonna. It's like starting all over. So get it out of the way, uh, set your armor's light, and get used to that tippiness. Um, I, I know that was one thing because I saw you see you. I know. <laughs> paddle a boat <laughs> without an arm. <laughs> you know? I haven't done that yet. But um, I still haven't gotten the whole flying the ama and, and paddling at the same time. I've gotten maybe three, maybe four strokes in. Um, but you know, it's 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 balance. And I mean, surfing, I can pop that thing out of the water anytime. You know, it's only because you know, it's like like the person that told me, "You hooli all the time." It was like a like a put down. Mm. And my comeback on that was, "Hey." If you ain't hooling, you ain't trying. <laughs> and that's exactly right. Um, the instability is speed, right? And stability is slow. So in outrigger canoes, instability is a really light ama, and it's dragging, it's skipping on the top very little, mm-hmm. and you go faster. And then stability is slow, right? Digging the ama deep in the water, yep. leaning left, right? And that's a good tip, right, is to have people, you know, identify their situation and just prepare to, to, to swim, right? Yeah. Get in the boat and fall right out of it. And boom, okay, the magic has happened. And now you can go out there and the second one's not so bad and the third one's not so bad. And it doesn't happen too many times. So you don't pay the swim tax that often before right. you get a feel for the unicycle that you're on, right? Once you figure okay. out where the line is at, you'll stop flipping, right? But it's yeah. a matter of being more um, in tune with where is that tipping point. And you got to cross the line a few times to get the hang of it. Yes, you do. That and uh, and I know one thing I did not do when I first started learning the uh, you know OC one is I did not do a hooli drill. Hmm. I think anybody who's new to it, take it off on a on a sandy area, beach, whatever, get out um, at least waist deep and flip over. Just flip it over and get yourself back in. You now, once you figure out how to get back in the boat, <clears throat> now I mean, to me, I don't think it's like you're worried about. I mean, nobody wants a hooli, mm-hmm. but at least you're not panicking <laughs> when you do hooli the first time, <laughs> right? Especially when your leash is wrapped around the boat. <laughs> yeah, figuring that all out, and like you said, it. A lot of it's comfort, right? Once you understand when the boat's going to flip, what it's going to do, how you're going to react, it's not an unknown, and you can you can relax, right? Like humans, when we have the unknown, instinctually we have to like tighten up to combat this, right? And when you tighten up, like you start freaking out, things start oh, to yeah. become very difficult, right? And it's just a matter of being relaxed. And the only way to bridge the gap from being tight to relaxed is simply doing it a few times. Right. Yes. And um, like you said, there's all kinds of online resources and stuff. If you Google, you know, how to, how to hooli recovery, there's something that's going to pop up, you know, on flipping the boat over, climbing back in and uh, all of that. Uh, it's funny you mentioned the YouTube. And uh, it's one of the reasons I wanted to make YouTube videos is there's so many people that need some information and they're going to get it from somewhere. Right. Yes. And I, I think I, I, like, I watch a lot of videos and I'm like, you know what? It like I if if there's information that's going to be out there, I want it to be a certain quality, right? I want it to be a certain standard. Some of them are safety, right? How to get back in your surf ski, Mm -hmm. how to get back in the outrigger canoe. Some of it's like posture, stuff like that. And then it was like, well, any thought, right? Like as long as people are looking for it, right, they're going to find it. And I want to make sure that it's, it's got the gold seal stamp on it. Right. I don't want them getting, you know, uh, bad advice and, you know, messing up their paddling progression and journey. And, uh, you know, it, it can't be understated how important of a resource YouTube is. Like you watch these videos and they may yeah. only have thousands of views, but there's not a lot of paddling, right? So that's like, there's a big chunk of the community that learned to steer an OC6 from this one video. 
or learn how to get back in their boat from this one video, right? Yeah. And so having more resources that are a little bit more in depth and so on, I think has been a big motivator for me putting that stuff out there. Yeah, I think one of the uh, one of the uh, videos you you had was um, you you were uh, showing how to keep in the arm of light, even the padding on the left side. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking like, man, like there goes my light bulb. It's like, you know, I just had to see it. And, you know, since you know, I watched that, I'm like, okay. So now when I'm paddling, I'm always, you know, checking my hip, you know, I'm looking at my armor, you know, I mean, I don't look at my armor the whole time, but <laughs> you know what I mean? When I can hear that little, you know, skipping, I was like, cool, all right. You know, of course, when I get back home, I'm, I'm checking the speed, how fast did I go today? What's my max speed, you know? When I, when I, one day I hit, um, it was like almost nine miles an hour mm -hmm. and it was like eight point, I don't know, maybe 8.78 or something like that. And I was going, damn, that was almost nine miles an hour. And I wasn't even doing downwinding. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that was with that day when I was uh, keep, trying to keep the arm alive. And, and once you get, like you said, that balance. <clears throat> Once you get that that comfort zone, and knowing like I know um, if I, I reach out a little bit further and dig, I can get the boat lighter, you know, on the on the uh, right side. You know, even just a little hip check. A, and it, yeah, when you hear that little tip, it's yeah. That now now I'm moving. <laughs> yeah. So the ama paddling left side uh, being light. So like you said. A lot of information is you have to see it or you have to hear about it or somebody has to tell you, right? I'm visual. And when people don't have a paddling community, that's the number one thing that I like have an affinity for. Like I started in Hernando. There's a time it was just me and YouTube videos, right? And it's so hard to get information. And a lot of people in a club dynamic, they have dozens of people they can bounce ideas off of. They have the support and so on. It's a lot of people, they have nothing, right? And so they rely on some of these, you know, pieces of information. So paddling left side, light ama. If I need to get on this podcast, I'm going to say his name. So the winner of the OC1 at Chattajack, Judson Gray, he stayed with us at um, Chattajack in the same house. And this guy, talent, talented, right? He's like six foot six. And like, if you think that it's cool when I paddle with the ama up on the right side, I watch this kid paddle a quarter mile, switch it back and forth with the ama just up in the air, like head high. And he's just <laughs> flying. And I'm in an OC2, and we placed, me and my partner, and we're cooking it for a mile going upriver. And Justin's, like, next to us with the AMA up, chilling, <laughs> paddling, and he's keeping up with us, right? So, like, you watch that, and it opens up your mind, like, holy crap. Like, he literally, his AMA barely touches the water when he's paddling. Like, when he wants to show off, he can put it three feet in the air. But when he's actually paddling, it's very light on the water. And I watched him switch to left side and I heard the ama skip and I look over. And I'm like, oh, I thought he was on the right side. And I'm watching him and I'm like, holy crap, he's paddling left side and it slap in the water as if he was paddling on the right. And it, oh, it changed my life. Right. I'm like, I didn't know. I didn't know that was possible. Right. And so I spent the next like six months like research and development on that. Right. Because I, you know, I didn't know anybody else that could do it, but I knew it was possible. So I go out and move my hip. I can't figure it out. And eventually I figured out what the, you know, the premise was then boxing, then packaging it into a YouTube video. Now I'm able to share that with a bunch yeah. of people. That video has like 2000 views, right? So there's 2000 eyeballs that saw that idea that stemmed from a super high level paddler that paddles, you know, all the time, but he's in California, right? Most people don't even know who the hell he is. Right. Yeah. But that's how that information can flow and get to, yes. you know, people that, otherwise would never see that or never know that those ideas are real. And, um, and the, what made that video cool is uh, Christina, my wife, she can do it too. Right. So it's yeah. like, here's two of us doing it. So, you know, it makes it seem like less of a circus trick and more of a, you know, if you put your mind to this concept, you know, you can make it your own. So looking at, all of our questions, we're all done. Is there anything that you want to end on to the the listeners of the podcast? This is going to go out to hundreds of people. So <laughs> you have any final thoughts that you want to share with them? 
I would say um, just a little bit touch back on uh, new paddlers. Mm-hmm. Don't worry about um, racing at first. Practice your your technique. You know, practice that. Um, do that's one thing I need to work on still. Every time I go paddle, I I I, I try to go out and you know paddle hard. Sometimes I just need to go out and just play around and practice different things. You know, like like the left side, you know, light on the arm. You know, don't beat yourself up. Uh, but <clears throat> now, what, what was your question again? <laughs> what are your final thoughts to our final viewers? Thoughts. <laughs> I think one of my, my final thoughts is uh, I'm going to use the word Ohana. Um, and, you know, Ohana is family. And the paddling community community is family. I have met so many great people, you know, and you know, of course, everybody you know knows me as Good Time, Good Time Richardson. And in fact, I think that was the uh, first race I raced at Hernando. And you announced <laughs> Good Time Richardson. That's right. Yeah, that's right, right. I always have people's <laughs> Facebook names, right? So the last one, uh, last video, Rob Merlin. His name is Merlin Brink. But he types it Merlin. I only write it down as Merlin. He's Merlin. <laughs> You're a good time, right? There's some other monikers out there, but you are yeah. a good time. It's going to say it in the thumbnail for this. It's going to say, Gary, good time, Richard. Right. <laughs> but no, no, I mean, it's just, you know what? Stay, stay positive and, uh, and teach the next person. You know, pass on the, uh, you know, what you've learned. And I mean, that's, that's about what I, I would say how I would like to end that is uh, treat other paddlers the same as the way you want to be treated. You know, um, help each other. I mean, I'm always trying to help somebody, you know, unlo- unloading someone's OC6 if they needed extra perf or, you know, try to help somebody fix their boat. <clears throat> you know, I'm not, I'm not so competitive where I want to take out competition. You know, I just want to be as good or, you know, stay close. <clears throat> but yeah, just, you know, be kind and uh, spread the wealth. You know, get, I mean, try to teach your kids how to pal. I mean, I think that's one thing um, that we as adults, we don't take that time as much. And, you know, try to, you know, the Hawaiians, I mean, they, they're teaching their kids at a young age. You know, I would love to see us start having a youth course. You know, it doesn't have to be an eight mile. You know, it'd just be great to bring the kids out and teach them, and get them involved. Awesome, Gary. So that concludes the paddle pursuit. Thank you so Perfect. much again for coming on and taking the time out to be on the show. Oh, thank you for having me, Robert. It was an honor. All right, that concludes this episode. We will see you guys next Monday for the next episode of Paddle Pursuit.